Okay, everyone, I think we're ready to start. It's a, a great pleasure for me today to uh, introduce uh, Elena Alvarez Mejaro from Madrid, who's this year's very worthy winner of the Adam Kilgariff Prize. But uh, first of all, just say a few words about the prize. The Adam Kilgariff Prize was established um, uh, right after Adam died in 2015, and we wanted uh, a memorial uh, of Adam. and what we wanted to reward was the kind of research that Adam himself um, might have done, or the kind of research that he would have been excited about, um, at the kind of intersection between um, computational linguistics and lexicography, which is where he did so much um, brilliant and very influential work. The prize is given every two years, and Elena is our fourth winner. Um, the first one, some of you will remember, was Pavel Grykowski, uh, who, uh, for his Polish Sign Language Corpus. Um, two years later, we had Matt Cole for his uh, very innovative and interesting hip-hop dictionary. Uh, and the previous winner, the last one, was Pilar Leon Arau, uh, who's actually here somewhere, um, uh, for her eco-lexicon project. So you can see that it's an incredibly diverse uh, set of work. Uh, all of it, really, really high standard. And in fact, most years uh, when we're reviewing the applications, we kind of want to give the prize to about three different people, but we, uh, we, well, we can't under the rules. We, we, have to pick, we have to pick one. And um, the high standard uh, that we've had since we began has been very much maintained this year with our latest winner, Elena Alvarez Mayaro, for her Lazaro project, uh, which is really a suite of projects. It tracks, as you can see, emerging anglicisms in the Spanish press, of which there are very many. Um, and uh, one of our key criteria in awarding the prize is what we call open science. And Elena's work embodies this really well. Um, she's created uh, software tools, corpus resources, and a growing database, and they are all publicly available. And on top of this, there's a kind of, a lot of sort of outreach to the non-specialist wider community uh, in the form of a Twitter feed. So really, uh, we just felt that Elena's project as a whole ticks absolutely all of the boxes, uh, and, it's, and it's quite brilliant. And she's gonna talk about it in a moment, but first of all, I'm gonna hand over to Jill Lambden, who is Adam's wife. And <laughs> Jill has a few things to say too. We have big things here. And she's got. <laughs> <laughs> have, have you got enough hands to hold that as well? I've got enough hands to hold this. Um, well, it's very nice to be here again with this prize, which uh, we're so proud and excited is happening. So um, I really want to thank Milos and Michael, Milan and Carol, who I think have been particularly instrumental in. In, in, in championing it, thank you for pushing it forward. Um, so, uh, so that's really on behalf of me, uh, Adam's wider family, because, um, because it makes us all really aware of how brilliant Adam was actually, and it keeps us as proud as proud as we can be of him. Um, I think when I probably, when I spoke to this prize before, I think I might have said something about Laurie Anderson, um, who wrote when her husband died, uh, some words. Uh, and I'm going to say them again because they still do important work for me when I think about what it means to die, what it might mean, which of course I do because, you know, because Adam died. Uh, so um, she said a person dies three times. The first, when their heart stops. The second, when they're buried. And the third, when their name is spoken for the last time. So you can see where I'm going with this, when the name is spoken for the last time, which is where I was going last time. I'm going somewhere else with this as well, which is to do with the beating heart. Um, so this prize reflects much of what kept Adam's heart beating um, his love of words, language, lexicography, corpus linguistics, innovation, impact, 
usability and good and open science. Those were the things that inspired him in his work and he loved his work. So, um, so uh, oh, and also, of course, going to conferences and the exchange of ideas, which I've already seen happening in the most exciting way today during breaks, during talks, and afterwards. So um, this prize is Adam alive in two of Laurie's three deathly categories, the beating heart and the speaking of his name, often in communities which look to the future while engaging with the past. Um, Adam would have loved this paper. He'd be really excited about, about these, uh, this spotting of anglicisms and the potential for weeding them out or just for looking at them in loads and loads of different ways. So a potential for um, the future and, uh, the, and, and usage. And the other thing he would have loved, because he was good at names, is he would have loved the name of the project as well. <laughs> so um, I'd just like to give you this on behalf of everybody, uh, mostly uh, on behalf of um, the Adam Kilgariff Prize Foundation team. Yeah, over, over to you, Elise. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, oh, thank you. Uh, can someone just let me know when I have 10 or five minutes left? Because otherwise, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I, f I feel extremely honored. Thank you. Um, so I'm here to present Lazaro, which is an automatic observatory of anglicism usage in the Spanish press. Um, I'm going to give you just a little bit of context first. What I'm presenting here was born as part of my master thesis and is, has now continued to be part of my PhD thesis, which means that this is work in progress. Um, so I'll let you know a bit of the history of the project, things that we've done and the state of the project now. But as I mentioned, uh, Hopefully there will be future work and there are things that still need uh, fixing or improving. So to begin with, what is the aim of this project? The aim of this project is to create a computational system that can detect and track new or recent or emergent anglicisms in Spanish newspapers. Just to make sure that everyone is on the same page. To begin with, what is an anglicism? What do we mean by anglicism? So an anglicism is a word that comes from English and is used in another language. So here you have a list of examples of anglicisms that we definitely see in Spanish. We use them in Spanish even when they come from English. So words such as podcast, app, online, crowdfunding, spin-off, big data, fake news, all these are English words, but we use them in Spanish. We see them in the press. Um, of course, this is not something specific to the Spanish language. There are many languages that uh, take words borrowed from English. English is a prolific source of new words in, in many languages, and particularly in the press, uh, because, well, uh, it's linked to international language, it's linked to new things and how they, uh, spread, how they spread uh, through the world. Um, so the aim is to monitor these anglicisms and these recent emergent anglicisms that are being incorporated in the Spanish press. Just one small thing, the approach and the motivation behind this project is purely descriptivist. Um, and probably this, uh, there's no need to mention like, that the, the, the aim is not to tell journalists or anyone else how they should write or what words they should avoid, but this is normally the kind of discourse that we find when we talk about anglicism. These are headlines that I've been collecting for the last years. They're in Spanish, but hopefully you can get the gist of what is being said. Anglicisms, are they a menace for the Spanish language, a threaten? Um, is it an inferiority complex or is it ignorance? And uh, anglicisms should be avoided at all costs, things like that. that. This is something that I find interesting because, well, 
I think that borrowing new words, borrowings and anglicisms in particular, I think they're one of the parts of language that are more present in public discourse. And I think that's, in, that's interesting. So my interest and my motivation for studying borrowings is not telling people what words they should avoid, but to understand a, a phenomenon that I think that it's fascinating and very interesting. Uh, why is borrowing interesting? Well, it's a manifestation of how languages change with time. Uh, also, new realities sometimes come with new words. When a new reality comes from another language, another culture, we bring the thing and we bring the thing with the name it was born with. So that's an interesting source of a new word that didn't exist before. Sometimes it's an old reality that already had a name, but the name got uh, substituted by a, a new word, which also has a social linguistic uh, interest in it. Why speakers chose to abandon a word that already existed and they choose to, to use and to incorporate a new word from, from uh, another language. I think these uh, things are all interesting. We, in Spanish, we have a word, barato, which means cheap or low cost, but we also have, for the last maybe decades, uh, the word low cost. And you couldn't really say that they mean exactly the same. Uh, so all these nuances are interesting uh, to observe. And of course, this is something that has been happening forever. It's not really that new, is it? And finally, uh, whenever we have a borrowing, a loan word, uh, an anglicism, if the anglicism stays in the language, if it's incorporated, it's very likely that it will go through a process of assimilation. So the speakers will manipulate the word to make it comply with the linguistic expectations that they have, to make it comply with the grammatical rules of the recipient language, so of the speaker's language. Uh, and that's also a very fascinating process to observe. And here you have how uh, football is written in Spanish or espaguetis. Uh, Italians normally are uh, shocked by the spelling, but yes, that's how we write it. So what's the task of the project then? We want to build a system that can automatically detect uh, so, computer-aided system that can automatically detest, detect unassimilated anglicisms in the Spanish press. In the Spanish press, so words borrowed from English, used in Spanish newspapers, not yet integrated into the recipient language, and uh, aided by computers or computer-assisted. Just so we have an example in mind, this is a, a piece of news, a headline that was like that. Um, Las prendas bestseller se estampan con motivos florales, animal print o arretales tipo patchwork. You have the translation there, kind of. So we're interested in words such as bestseller, animal print, and patchwork. This is the type of thing that we want our system to detect and track. How could we build this? Well, maybe the, there are a few approaches that would be the most natural or the first that come to mind when we think about how can we build a, a, a program that performs this kind of task. The, one, the first one would be, Dictionary lookup. Okay, we'll give the sentence to the computer. The computer will go word by word and check whether each uh, word in that sentence appears in a word list, in a lexicon, in a dictionary of Spanish or not, or if it appears in a dictionary of English or not. We could do different combinations, but that would be the general idea. Uh, second option, maybe, could be there are certain combination of letters, certain, certain patterns that are very normal in English, but totally unheard of in Spanish or very unlikely. So words ending in ing, uh, words starting with wh, very normal in, in English, very, very rare in Spanish. So we could say if a word contains something like this, it's very likely that it will be English. And a third approach, maybe a little bit more sophisticated is, let's say that we have a lexicon of Spanish. We could, just by counting occurrences of, of letters and co-occurrences of letter, we could calculate how likely it is that a given letter in Spanish is followed by another letter. So given a word, we could calculate what's the probability of that word being Spanish. It, it would take to maybe define a threshold and say, if the probability is below this threshold, of, uh, we can say that it's not Spanish, and therefore a borrowing. These are approaches that seem very natural, and this has been tried before. But, this 
has, has some limitations, and I'll show you some of them. Uh, we have a borrowing in an Anglicism in Spanish that is called, that is prime time. It's referred to the time of day where people are watching TV, and it's like the time when most people are watching TV, and uh, normally during the evening. And prime time is a borrowing in Spanish, but prime happens to also be prime, which is a, a conjugated form uh, in Spanish. Same happens with time, which is a form of the verb timar and not only time. So you could have, you could find prime and time as words in the Spanish uh, dictionary. And also there is no pattern matching that could deal with this. And could also the calculating the probability of word of the word prime, prime, time, time, tell us something about it? Uh, not really, it's not, it's not a good approach to take for this, for this uh, scenario. Uh, similar with social media. Social media is an anglicism in Spanish, but social and media both exist as Spanish words. And not to mention proper nouns. If we have the something like Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Heart Club Band, those are words, English words, but they are not borrowings, are they? It's, it's a proper noun, it's a named entity. Um, also not to mention that the fact that the word appears in an English dictionary doesn't mean it's a borrowing, because it could, if you're dealing with the language of the press, it could also be a literal quotation. A politician said something. It could be a proper noun, or it could be metalinguistic usage. Uh, you could start thinking, maybe if, I, uh, if it's in uppercase, then it means it's a proper noun. Yeah, but sometimes Anglicisms are also written in uppercase, and sometimes they can appear at the beginning of the sentence, so how do you know if it's a proper name or it's just at the beginning of the sentence? So things get convoluted really uh, easily with all these little cases that uh, are, are, are difficult and frequent. So the thing is, what we want is a system that given a sentence such as, me gusta mucho Johnny Cash, I really like Johnny Cash, knows that Cash in that um, context, it's not an anglicism, it's not a borrowing, but if we say estoy sin cash, where cash is like a, a slang uh, anglicism for money, in that case, yes, we have an anglicism. The thing is, there is not a single rule we can use to determine whether a given word in isolation is an anglicism, because being an anglicism is something that is highly dependent on context. So, when rules can't take you to the place you want to go, machine learning might be able to take you close enough. So we're going to go from a system that gives the computer a set of rules uh, is it in a dictionary or not? Does it contain a pattern or not? That would be the set of rules. We're going from a set of rules approach to a data-driven approach. We're going to uh, give the computer a bunch of examples of anglicisms, and hopefully that would be the way that the, uh, the, the computer learns what an anglicism is. So this is the step-by-step -step, uh, method that we followed to create a machine learning model for detecting anglicisms in Spanish. First, we will gather a corpus that is rich in anglicisms. We will manually annotate that corpus, so we will mark for each sentence in that corpus, is this an anglicism or not, is this an anglicism or not. We will give that annotated corpus, that set of examples, uh, to a machine learning model, and hopefully, hopefully, if the corpus, if the annotated corpus is good enough, if the, if the examples are good enough, representative enough, the model, the machine learning model, will through statistical correlations, we'll learn, and I hate, the, the, I hate the word learn because not really learning, it's metaphorically learning, but we'll learn to recognize new anglicisms. But again, hopefully. Um, so that was exactly what we've been doing since 2020, which is when this project started. Um, we have framed the task of uh, building this machine learning model for anglicism detection as a sequence labeling problem, which means the model will take a sentence as input. Each word, the model uh, will take every word and assign a tag to it. Is this an anglicism or not? Is this an anglicism or not? Is this an anglicism or not? Uh, the thing is, each tag will be assigned not only based on what the word looks like, but also depending on the surrounding context. So what were the previous words in that sentence? What were the previous tags assigned to that sentence and so on? So in the end, what the computer is trying is not only to give the most likely tag to that uh, given word, but to create the sequence of tags that maximizes the probability of that sequence. So that's the, the machinery behind this. 
if you're familiar with the NLP uh, jargon, this is exactly the same approach that is taken in other NLP tasks, such as name entity recognition and part of speech tagging. So if you're familiar with those tasks, tasks this is basically exactly the same. Um, here you would have some examples of those uh, annotated sentences that the machine learning model will uh, encounter, will find. Here you have, you have to read this in vertical, so este mes os sugerimos probar el batch cooking, roughly translated as this month we recommend you try batch cooking. And as you see, O in this case means not a borrowing. Uh, B, E, N, G means this is a borrowing. And the thing with this BIO encoding, the O, it's clear, the B, okay, means this is a two-token anglicism, two-token or more. So if let's say that we had uh, a three-token, an anglicism that is made up of three or more tokens, it would be B, I, 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 and then if it's, again, another word that is not an anglicism, again, O. That's uh, the, the thing about this, this is called BIO encoding. The B is begin, uh, uh, begin of, the, of the chunk. Uh, I is inside and O is outside. I'm outside of an anglicism, begin anglicism and inside of the anglicism. The thing about this uh, encoding is that it's very helpful to account for um, multi-token anglicisms, but also when is it that a token is part of a multi-token or not. So in here, for instance, la era de las apps para ligar, the era of apps for dating, there's only one anglicism, is app, apps, so it's labeled as such. But in here, it's not apps that is the anglicism, it's dating apps. It's the full uh, two-token thing. So this is the kind of annotation it's normally found in named entity recognition tasks. It's, I think, very well suited to account for this kind of nuances um, in multi-token anglicisms. So this, is it, this is the type of annotation that we would that we would perform and that we would expect the machine learning model to uh, return to us. So with these uh, ideas in mind, we created a first model. It was a conditional random field model, which is considered classic machine learning, meaning that it's not deep learning. Uh, what, does that, what does the model see? The model see each word, but it also assigns, uh, assigns or uh, uh, represents each word that is given to the model as a set of features that we previously deci decided. So when the model is seeing the word, it sees the word, but it's also, it also analyzes things like, is it a punctuation mark? Does it contain a hyphen? Uh, is it in uppercase? Is it in lowercase? All these characteristics that we previously defined because we thought could be of help, could be good indicators of something being a borrowing or not. Uh, another thing that is taken into account is, is this a quotation mark? Is this word preceded by a quotation mark? Is it in italics? That kind of information is what the model is taking into account. And by seeing all these examples that we're giving to it, saying this word that has these characteristics happens to be an anglicism, this word that has these other characteristics is not an anglicism. If we give the model enough examples, the model ends up finding these correlations of hmm, containing this set of characters make it likely to be an anglicism, hmm, containing this other thing or being preceded by a quotation marks and so on. So this conditional random field model was trained and tested on a corpus of Spanish press that was annotated with anglicisms. Um, this corpus was created and annotated from scratch for this uh, project. And we have, when the model was trained, so after the model had seen all these examples and had found all these correlations between features and being an anglicism or not, we evaluated it. So we gave new examples and say, okay, let's see how you do. Let's see if you can detect, detect anglicisms properly. And the results that we got was an 87. Bear in mind that 100 would be a perfect model. 87 is not bad. Uh, but uh, it's not perfect and we will see why. This model and this corpus was developed in 2020 uh, and it was in production in between 2020 and 2022. And I mentioned, and I said that the model, the model was not doing bad, but there were things that could be improved. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain uh, what I mean. Um, Anglicisms, as many other things in language and in life, follow a long tail distribution, meaning that what we have is a very small set of anglicisms that are super highly, extremely frequent, which will be the, the, the ones like in the green area. So 
we could have things like, I don't know, online, app, podcast, and marketing. So it's a small set of anglicisms that have super high frequency. But then we have a very, very, very long tail of borrowings that are, or anglicisms that are very rare. But that's a very, very long, so the amount of anglicisms that are actually rare is huge. And they're just like a bunch of um, very frequent anglicisms. So the thing is, what we are interested in is having a model that is capable of detecting not only the anglicisms in the green area, but also the anglicisms in the yellow area. Why? Because if we are interested in tracking new things, and if we're interested in tracking and doing something that can help linguists and lexicographers analyze uh, new borrowings, then we didn't need to build this model if what we wanted was just a model that could analyze or detect app online and uh, marketing. That's, I mean, if you want to track these, just look them up and that's it. But if you want to, you, you want to make sure that the model that you're using can detect previously unseen things. Uh, because actually speakers do that. Speakers know when something is a borrowing or an anglicism, even if they haven't seen it before. So what we want is a model that we can train, we can train it in the green area and we but can succeed and can detect things in the yellow area. So that's what we went for. And we created, ooh, Okay, we created, well, here's, it says a second model. We created many other models, but this is the one that uh, performed the best. Uh, there were uh, maybe seven more models that we tried and we tested, but this was the one that was the best performing one. So we, ha we created a second model that it's, if you like the NLP jargon machine learning thingy, it's uh, a BioSDM CRF model. Uh, if you remember uh, the previous model, what it took as input was the word, but the word was um, analyzed looking for, is it punctuation, is it a digit, is it a quotation mark, is it that, what characters does it contain? Okay, this model works differently because it's a deep learning model, so what goes inside the model, is, uh, it's a combination of word embedding, embeddings, so vectorial representation of words. Uh, in this case, it was a combination of transformer-based word embeddings, pre-trained on, co on code switch data, along with subword embeddings. Um, that was the combination that did the trick and that performed better. We tried other things. And we, this model, we trained it and we tested it uh, on a corpus that we called uh, Koalas, a corpus of anglicisms in the Spanish press. If you see, uh, if you remember the, the number of tokens in the previous um, data set, the, differ the difference between them is not that big. This one here is 370,000 tokens. The previous one was 325,000. So it's bigger, but it's not that big. But there's two fundamental differences compared to the previous one. One is way more, more diverse. We included here mm, different sources. The other one was made of um, articles only from one uh, newspaper. Here we used several newspapers and several publications. We made sure that there were uh, many sections and topics involved. And what is key, the, the main important thing, is not only that it was diverse, it was that we made sure that the anglicisms that were seen during training were not present in the evaluation. So what we wanted to make sure is, okay, you, this model has been trained using, or has, during training has seen these, uh, this list of anglicisms. We want to give it examples that contain not only different sentences, but only anglicisms never seen during training. Anglicisms that the model has never seen, has never seen before, has never seen as anglicism or anything else. And, again, and also we added some difficult cases of things that looked like an anglicism, but where they were not, uh, and things like that. So we wanted to make sure that whatever the result was, we were testing if the model was good at generalization, at generalizing to previously unseen data. Results on that, uh, with that model and that data set I just described was an 85. If you, if you remember, the previous model on the previous data set was 87. So you might think this is disappointing because it was lower. Bear in mind that the CRF model, so the previous model, when we tested it on this uh, more rigorous, way more difficult exam, it got a 55. So definitely the previous model had issues with generalization and with previously unseen data. This model here was performing better at that. 
Uh, this model was developed, and this model and this corpus was developed in 2021 and has been in production since 2022. And hold on a second, because I said before that the other model was in production until 2022 and that this model went into production in 2022. What went into, what's production? Where are those models going? Uh, well, to the to Lazaro, which is the observatory uh, that was, the purpose of the project was to build an observatory that monitored anglicisms, and that's what Lazaro is. Um, the motivation or the idea for the project, I, I mentioned that I had been working on this since 2020, but I think that the idea, I had it many years before that. Many, many years ago, I worked among uh, corpus linguists and lexicographers that were uh, tracing and studying how the language of the press changed and what new words were appearing. And they did this work by hand, the work of looking for new words and new borrowings in the newspapers. And I think it was from that uh, time and from those years that I got the idea of we should have some way of making this automatic, because whatever you can do just by hand, just by reading the press, it's not very systematic and it's not massive. So the idea was basically to build a system that could do this, anal this daily analysis um, uh, automatically every day. By the way, the name Lázaro is a tribute to a Spanish linguist, linguist Fernando Lázaro Carreter, um, who was a very well-known linguist. Uh, he was very popular in the 80s and in the 90s. And very popular, I mean, everyone in Spain knows him, not just like linguists. And he used to write newspaper columns, normally admonishing against the usage of uh, anglicisms. And I thought it was a nice tribute to name the, the observatory or the observatory after, after him. So here's, the, how, here's how the observatory uh, works. So we began by tracking eight newspapers. Today it's 22, so newspapers and magazines are being tracked. So every day a program wakes up uh, in the server and goes to these 22 journal uh, magazines and newspapers and grabs the articles that have been published in the last 24 hours. They get the text. The text is uh, cleaned uh, for HTML uh, uh, removal and so on. And the texts are sent to the BioLSTM CRF model or before to the CRF model. The model reads those uh, texts and labels, annotates, tags, extracts what the words that it thinks are good anglicism candidates. And those anglicisms are stored in a database, along with the information on where they were found, what the date was, what section, what newspaper, and so on, so on. And that information is um, used to create visualizations on uh, how frequent certain words are, how frequent, uh, what sections do these uh, words appear, and so on. And actually, I think I can, I had screenshot, but I think it's better if I show you directly. It's, yes, nope. Yes. Uh, this is the website. If you go to um, observatoriolazaro.es, there's an English version of it. Uh, this is Lazaro Observatory. This is the website live. Um, as you see here, it's 22 newspapers that have been monitor the number of words that have been, this started, the, the uh, observatory started, I can even tell you the day. It was April 18th, 2020, the first time it uh, did the complete uh, going to the newspaper, get the articles and so on. Um, this is the total no number of anglicisms that has have been uh, detected. So total number of uh, occurrences, so appearances of, uh, so uh, tokens, not types. And this is the total number of unique anglicisms so far. Bear in mind that there are mistakes. Uh, I assure you, there are errors here. But to be honest, and during evaluation, one of the things that we saw is that the main issues are with the anglicisms that are not detected. detected. So you could have two types of errors. You could have, oh, the model said this word is an anglicism, but it was not. But you could, say, you could also have the model thought this was not an anglicism, and it was. That second type of error is the one that is most frequent. So in this 35 something, 35,000 and this 700,000, we are seeing errors. But I'm sure that the number of errors for omission are larger than, uh, than the ones that for false positives. 
Um, so the thing with this is that you can paint graphs, who is something that it's always fun to do. And this is, these are the 10 most frequent anglicisms uh, uh, that were uh, detected during uh, 22 and so on. So uh, it's app, influencer, look, marketing, online, podcast, ranking, reality, software, and streaming, and the frequency and how it changed. And here you have, uh, actually we can, these, these were retrieved earlier today, this morning. If you see, it's 27th, June 27th. So this morning, uh, the model detected this uh, anglicism, and you can see, well, the, the, the word, the context, the newspaper it appeared in, if you click here, it will take you to the, to the article and the, and the uh, date. There's also, uh, <laughs> there's also a search, you can search, so, so the, the database, that database with 700,000 can be queried online. So um, let's say that if you want to look for red carpet, which is an anglicism that I really like. The reason, so you can look for it and it says, yes, red carpet is here. Uh, I know something about red carpet. And here it is. I, like, I really like red carpet because it's similar to prime time because red is also red, which is a word in Spanish, which means net. So not an anglicism uh, in, if, when you're talking about nets, but definitely an anglicism when it's in red carpet. So uh, you have all the information that the observatory has on that word being uh, red carpet. Yes, it's an anglicism. I have seen red carpet and red carpets, the, frequent, the average frequency, the frequency during the last 30 days, because sometimes Anglicisms become very popular, uh, and you can see with the changes in frequency. And where do you usually find it? What sections of the newspaper? So here you have like fashion and uh, uh, magazines targeted to women and things like that, lifestyle and things like that. So here you can see how the changes in frequency along the time, the timeline, how it has changed. And here you have all the examples, all the times the observatory grabbed or detected uh, red carpet as an anglicism. So there are a bunch of them, and you can see here. Um, mm, nope. Yes. So yeah, it, it, this is exactly the same. I just uh, I thought it was uh, nicer to see it live rather than on screenshots. But here's the same thing, the same thing. This is guilty pleasure. Um, again, you can see how the uh, frequency has changed, how the how the frequency changes in time, and it has seen guilty pleasure and guilty pleasures. Uh, also, in apparently in fashion, uh, it's something that is found. Red carpet, booster. Uh, something that I like, uh, and I have I've had. Uh, fun doing is you get to somehow see the news through anglicism usage. So booster, which was an anglicism that was not very frequent uh, before 2020, or at least in the early 2020, became super popular in 2021 because it was used to refer to the COVID vaccination and so on. So here you can see like the uh, be, uh, you can see booster being born and then uh, declining through time because you can see here how, how it peaked at some point during 2021 and now, uh, fortunately, it's uh, not as frequent anymore. Uh, offshore, this one I really like. If you see, there's a super high peak, like a crazy peak in frequency in, at the October 2021 and it was linked apparently to the... Uh, I remember the Pandora Papers, I think they were called. It was uh, Panama Papers. Yeah, it was uh, this uh, leak of information of companies that had uh, like bank accounts offshore and they weren't paying taxes. So suddenly you, you, I know, you're looking at something else and you say, what's going on with offshore? Ah, okay, the Panama Papers. And you see this massive peak here. Uh, you can uh, search as I uh, showed. Burger, cheeseburger, bacon burger. You can you can look for the word itself, but you can also see what combinations it appears in, uh, and go to the corresponding page for that anglicism and the information linked to it, all the appearances, so on. And one thing that I thought would be fun to do was um, to build a Twitter bot, which is called Lazaro Bot. Um, the idea behind the bot is that whenever the pipeline, the observatory, finds an anglicism that it has not been seen before, it will be sent to the 
the bot and the bot will tweet it. So it's kind of, if the graphs, if, the, if you remember the graph with all the lines, in that we were seeing the, the anglicisms that are the most frequent ones. What, we, what you get to see in the bot is the very weird stuff, because it's the thing that the model is seeing for the first time. So it's interesting to see, oh, I had never seen this anglicism before, I'll tweet it. Of course, you also get to see the errors, which Honestly, I have fun looking at, and it gives me ideas about, oh, this is something that the model finds difficult. So it's also interesting to see that. Here you have uh, binge watching, uh, anxiety baking, of course, from 2020. <laughs> uh, old school, es un diseño básico, muy old school. So the bot tweets, the anglicism itself, the sentences where it was found, and the link to the uh, article where it was found. Um, also, you get to see, as I mentioned, uh, errors. For some reason, at some point, this was with the CRF model, so with the old model, the first one that we created, um, there was, for some reason, it got obsessed about date prisa, which means hurry up. The model thought this was a borrowing, and it didn't think it, it, it was not just once. Like, for some months, it was obsessed with date prisa being a borrowing, and I was like, no, maybe because dates, maybe it had seen date as part of an anglicism or as part of dating apps. It, this makes me wonder. I, I enjoy uh, looking at the output of the model because it makes me wonder. Not, I mean, I appreciate the, the, when, it, the, when the model is right, but I'm really curious when it didn't work as it was supposed to. Like, why did it think this was a borrowing? And what could we change so this mistake is not made anymore. And this is basically what one of the things that I'm working on as part of my PhD thesis is on working on evaluation, on how do we evaluate these models and how can we know why they are good at some things and why they are good at bad at some other things. So that Prisa, yeah, this was uh, his obsession for some time. Um, the data is not reliable in terms of uh, I keep adding some, uh, I've been adding some uh, news and some other uh, journals and uh, magazines and newspapers. So there are big changes from one month to the other. But I thought that maybe you were curious to see numbers from May, which were just retrieved. Um, in May, 30,000 articles were crawled, 40,000 borrowings were extracted, so occurrences, 6,000 of them were unique, and around 2,000 of them were seen for the first time. Um, also, yeah, uh, uh, these numbers are from the, I don't have numbers for the current model, but I have them from the pre previous model. Also take it with a, grain, with a pinch of salt because the data is not always, it's not perfect, so there might be errors. But I got that in average, there are like two anglicisms every thousand words. But there are sections where, wow, there it's, the number is so much bigger. So fashion is 17. Anglicisms per thousand words. Uh, tech is seven anglicisms per thousand words, and TV is four anglicis anglicisms uh, for per thousand words. But uh, again, uh, don't trust these numbers too much because if we change them all and we, new cal we do calculations, they, they're likely to change. Uh, also, I've been referring the whole time to anglicisms because anglicisms make up for more than 95% of uh, the borrowings that are used in Spanish, which is a lot. Uh, in the annotation that I uh, showed you before with the BIO encoding, the BN and the IN, we had another label that we also used for uh, borrowings from other languages. So it was other. It could have made sense to have something for French, something for Japanese, but the thing is, uh, there are very few examples. So that means that it makes no sense to have one per language, so we just decided to have one that was a borrowing that is not from English. Still, the numbers of examples for that label is very, is very small. That makes the, the model not super optimized for those cases and the evaluation not as reliable. Still, as I mentioned, uh, these are very, uh, there are very few cases. English is absolutely dominant in terms of uh, uh, borrowing. And what else? Uh, some of the satellite projects that have been uh, developed around or that uh, are part of the of the Lazarus uh, project is that uh, those 700,000 anglicisms occurrences that I mentioned, they are all available at the website. There is a, a tab, a section called data, so you can basically download the whole database in form of uh, 
CSV files from April 2020. So there it says data, you see them there. Uh, the models that have been developed, so the, the detection models for anglicisms, the annotation guidelines, and the annotated corpora that were used for training and evaluating all these models are available on GitHub and on Hugging Face. If you don't want to use uh, Hugging Face models, which sometimes are Hugging Face library, so it, it sometimes it can be uh, a little bit painful to use, or maybe you're not uh, uh, familiar with it. There's also a Python library called PyLazaro that you can install through pip. And it, you can, it's basically a program that you just use from Python and ask, give me what are the anglicisms in this sentence, and it will give you back the output. In fact, the observatory is built on top of PyLazaro. So it's the same thing that is, instead of relying on the media that I chose to, to monitor, you could just give it any text. Uh, there's also Adobo, which is automatic detection of barrel wings. It was a shared task that we organized in 2021 concerning detection of uh, barrel wings. Uh, hopefully, there will be new additions uh, soon. And if you're curious about the uh, uh, details, technical details, there are uh, a bunch of papers published uh, around the project. And what else? Uh, I think that's everything that I have. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much to ELEX Conference, the Board of Trustees, and the sponsors of the Adam Kilgariff Prize. And also, I'm um, very lucky to be advised uh, by Julio Gonzalo from UNED and Constantin Legnos from Brandeis University as part of my thesis. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. And I think that's everything I have. Yes. Thanks so much, Elena, and you've, you've finished wonderfully on time and, and conveyed your fantastic enthusiasm for, for the project, uh, which I think we all feel. Uh, so I if anyone has any questions for Elena, please uh, put your hand up. Thank you very much. I was wondering if it would be possible to reuse your model, train them on data from other languages, would it work or would you need some other system development? Um, for other languages, uh, mm. so my first instinct would be if you want to train a, a model for, I don't, say, I don't know, maybe Portuguese or whatever, you would need to have an annotated corpus fit it to the model, but an annotated corpus of that language, annotated with the borrowings and so on. But now that uh, you mention it, I, I'd be curious to see if you if you use the same, if you do like transfer learning approach of, I have something that detects things in Spanish. How well would it work in Portuguese? That is close enough. I'm not sure how that would go. I would be curious. I hadn't thought of it. But I mean, I think that the, not the correct, but the most canonical thing to do would be train your own model using another data set that is suitable for the task that you want to do. So in this case, let's say Portuguese. But I don't think it would be that crazy to try the transfer learning approach. Of course, uh, the closer the language is to Spanish, I'd, I'd, I'd say that the better the model would work. But I guess that it, that would be also something to try. I, I don't know how it would go, but now I'm curious. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for, for a nice and in inspiring presentation. I'm, I'm curious to know about the errors. You, you said you, you actually get some fun analyzing them and wondering why. And I'm also curious, have you found any pattern or a group of patterns? And if you have, would you use that to retrain the system? Yes. Um, the one that is, uh, oh, sorry. The one that is uh, uh, working right now, it's I haven't retrained it, but the CRF, so the first model that we created, I kept updating the data. When, when the, da the data prisa error, the way that I had to correct it was provided with a bunch of examples where data prisa was happening, saying, no, not, a, not an anglicism, not any more data prisa, please. Um, also, yeah, concerning errors, there are some cases where, like, there are anglicisms that are so obvious that they are not Spanish because of their spelling. Uh, I, that's not the most frequent error. The, the most frequent error is a word that could potentially look like something that resembles Spanish. Uh, I was thinking, uh, let me think of an example. 
Um, so prime time, for instance, would be one or, mm, I don't know, uh, where something, oh yeah, I remember. Something like, I'm sorry, I'm not a sports person, but burpees, is that a thing? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's nothing in the spelling of burpees, which is written like B-U-R-P-E-S. It could even be a verb like burpear or something like that. Uh, so that was an that was an error. I have here. This is from Noob. This is from the CRF uh, model, so not the current one. But these were some of the things that were uh, detected and uh, in part, uh, detected as as borrowings when they shouldn't be. Uh, so things like punto com, which is a neologism, uh, things that were uh, in quotations and looked potentially like a borrowing, uh, things that were inside uh, uh, movie titles, uh, music, things like that. Not always, but sometimes they will be uh, a cause for, for mistakes, for instance. Hi, thank you for an excellent talk, a really interesting presentation. I just wondered if you've compared, or if you frequently compare the results you get from this with more traditional sources like uh, the Observ Observatorio de Neologismos and how they compare with the things found by human analysts. No, I haven't done that. Um, I think that I've been so concerned with building the models that I feel that the output, I'm, I'm just like throwing it to the side, to the website, and it's hopefully someone will do something out of this. But I'm like, I feel like I'm inside the kitchen cooking the models. Sure, it would be, it would be kind of interesting to see how many they miss. I'm sure it's loads, right? Yeah, I'm, I, no, I'm, I'm, in, I'm interested to see what things that the model gets the humans don't get, and what things that the human gets, the models don't. Hi, thanks very much. Um, I was interested in the figure of 700,000 anglicisms you had found so far and puzzling over how that could be unique anglicisms because a typical unabridged dictionary might have 230,000 terms in it. And so just when did that mean 700,000 times they occurred or what are you counting to get that figure? The, seven the 700,000? The 700,000 is like, uh, let's say, sentences that contain an anglicism. So occurrences. Yeah. So yeah, yeah there's no way there's 700,000 anglicisms. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I think I love almost everything about this project. And the only question is I'm not I'm not that familiar with the model. Um, and two informations would be pretty interesting to get out of there. The first one is could there could you derive some kind of confidence value of the model um, that it assigns a specific label? And the other one would this is a question I'm pretty sure that the model it doesn't know that um, I checked your Twitter feed and, for example, there was French pixie, whatever that is. I it's don't it's know. It's something with uh, haircuts. I think so, yeah. yeah. And a few, year, a few days before that, it was French pixies. So, so the model doesn't have any representation whatsoever that this is a, well, Plural. It's the same type, right? It's the same lemma, but... Yeah, um, these yeah. are my two questions. I'm, I'm going to start with the second one. Um, the way it works right now is if, a new, if you find a new form, like if, because the, the results of the model go into the database, the uh, rule that I have is if this is the first time this form is being written on the database, send it to the Twitter bot. But the form is linked to a lemma. Uh, I sometimes think whether, and, and I thought at the time, whether I should say, if you haven't seen this lemma, so that would be French pixie and then not French pixies anymore. Then I also thought that it was interesting to see how sometimes um, the morphological adaptation of the word or the, the, word, or the, the, the way we build the, the plurals, sometimes it's interesting. Sometimes we do weird things. Of course, it's weird because it's not our language or it's not for Spanish speakers. They will do it the way they consider natural. So sometimes I thought, 
okay, maybe I want to see how the plurals form and how these little variations happen. So that's the way I have it configured now. Um, I'm sorry, the first one was, ah, what's the level of confidence uh, of the labels that being assigned to by the model, right? So there will be, it will be for each sentence, it will be, it will be different because when the model is labeling, it takes into account not only the word, but also the surrounding context, the previous tags. One of the things I'm working on right now for the evaluation uh, part of it that I'm uh, getting my hands dirty with is I want to see that data. So I can't give you the confidence per tag because it changes depending on the context and depending on the sentence. But I'd be curious to see, would I get better results if I lowered the threshold and say, if you have a suspicion, even if it's the slightest suspicion that this may be a borrowing, label it. And I want to see what happens when I do that. Uh, so that's one of the things I want to tune and uh, inspect. Yeah, it's my turn. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, two questions. Oh, hi. Yes. Um, one is, do you monitor usage of the website? Oh, sorry. Oh, uh, can you repeat the, que the question? Sorry. Do you monitor usage of the website? So what are the queries or uh, how many users per day? I have the information. I don't really look at it that much. Like I have Google Analytics installed uh, and I can get it. I don't really follow it much. I've had some weird um, uh, usage and I'm pretty sure that it was crawled at some point because Either it was that, or there was a very weird user that uh, looked for anglicisms like a, I don't know, a crazy way for hours uh, at night one day. So uh, it, it was either that or I don't know. Um, but yeah, I'm not really sure. I can't, I can't give you a number on that. Uh, and the second question would be, uh, have you considered um, including the, the sort of crowdsourcing aspect of the website where you get feedback from the people visiting? So like someone saying, hey, this is, you said that the model says this is a borrowing, but it's definitely not. Exactly, yes. That could be a way to go. Um, also, I feel that I could use that as part of the, as an annotation, like a crowdsourced annotation. I, I would have to think about it. My first uh, intuition, but I, I know, I, I would need to think about this a little bit longer, is that I'd rather, if I'm going to retrain the model with new data, that would be a way of, re of getting more data, I'd lean towards having linguists uh, annotate the data. So, but I'm not sure. Maybe, but one of the things is annotating is always, uh, it's, it's, it takes a long time, it's difficult, it's, you get to have a, group of people involved, annotating, and so on. So maybe that would be a way to go. I, didn't, I haven't, I, I haven't think about that before, but maybe I should. Should I? If there was one question in the Percentage of anglicisms. Is the percentage of anglicisms uh, over time stable? Or can you see that you get more and more? Anglicisms in um, Spanish. With the data that I have right now, um, there are several things happening. One, it's been from 2020, so it's not that many years. Two, the, the observatory has been using different models. So um, I'm sure that if I look at the data now, there are more Anglicisms now than a year ago. But the difference is not the people or the language. The difference is my model. My model is capable of detect de 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 detecting more. Um, I know that there were some uh, statistics on Anglicism usage from the 1990s. Uh, I don't remember the exact figure, but I'm pretty sure that the numbers that they got or they reported were way lower than what I, than, than, than what I have. Um, but again, it's difficult to know whether in the 90s there were less Anglicisms or whether the manual uh, uh, calculation of, of all this maybe leaves things uh, behind. Because here you're also seeing very weird things, uh, very weird, ang rare anglicisms happening. So it's it's difficult to know uh, whether whether it's correct to say that there has been an increase. Mm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank thank you, Elena. I'm, I'm sure that Elena's talk has inspired us all to go and have a good look at the observatorio. Um, before we wrap up, I just wanted to 
give a very warm thank you to my fellow members of the panel, uh, which judges uh, adjudicates on the Adam Kilgariff Prize. That's uh, Milos, um, Carola over there, Carola Talbiris, um, Pavel Rifvi, uh, Istok Kosen, and Ilan, who everyone knows Ilan, and he must be around here somewhere. There's Ilan. So thanks to all of you. I mean, it, we, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's, uh, it's really, really interesting work and, and, and inspiring too. So just to finally say congratulations to Elena and to thank her very much for a, a wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you.